everybody, we are so happy to welcome uh, Shams Tabriz. Uh, Shams is a staff engineer at Wayfair. Uh, he holds a, a, a bachelor degree in computer science and engineering, and he has more than 10 years experience as a software engineer. Today, Shams will talk to us about Git versioning and software test uh, best practices. Oh dear Shams, the screen is yours. Thank you, Safar. Uh, welcome to my talk. Uh, so today we are going to talk about Git and some software testing best practices. Uh, I'm working as staff engineer at Wayfair, uh, almost about uh, four years and a half. Uh, so today's agenda would be uh, twofold. One would be uh, talking about key best practices, and the next uh, section would be uh, about software testing best practices. And uh, in the end, we will have a question and answer uh, section. So the, a quick uh, uh, introduction to Git. I'm pretty sure everyone already uses that. Uh, it was primarily uh, designed for uh, a distributed coordinating uh, environment for programmers uh, to ensure speed, data integrity, and uh, to support a distributed nonlinear workflows. And over the years, Git community came up with various tips and tricks uh, to get best out of Git. Uh, today, we are going to talk about some of them uh, which helped me uh, significantly in my day-to-day -day, uh, work. So uh, go, uh, without uh, talking about Git further, let's uh, see some get, get best practices. Uh, the first one would be uh, write concise and meaningful commit messages. So in many aspects, uh, the commit history we create in Git uh, is kind of a narrative that tells us uh, how the code evolved uh, to its current state. Uh, while there are different ways of telling a story, but a badly told narrative could, could always hurt us. So it is important to uh, think about the logical order in which your changes make most sense and formulate and format your log messages properly. If, you, if we see the example on the right side, uh, this is a very simple template we follow. So on the left, the template says there's a type and uh, is followed by a uh, title, and then there's an optional body. The type means what type of uh, commit it is. Uh, as an example here, uh, I'm using, I'm fixing a bug. So I put it as a bug fix and then the title itself. And uh, following an optional body, which explains why, uh, what exactly was wrong and how we fixed it, not the detail, just the highlight. This really helps to identify later how the code evolved. The good part is also you can use a Git template uh, uh, to automate this uh, commit uh, message. All you have to do is write that uh, in your Git config. That will show up when you uh, commit anything and you integrate with your uh, IDE or console. The next one is uh, commit early and often. Having periodic checkpoint uh, means uh, later you can understand how you broke something. So uh, when you work small, uh, commit it, and uh, iterate through. You will get out, get uh, best out of the Git when you commit uh, your work often. Because uh, if you wait for a big change to happen, it might be a lot of things later to find out what exactly was the main problem which broke your uh, uh, program. So it, it helps also uh, to keep your code updated with the latest changes so that you, you avoid the conflicts. The next one would be, uh, don't try to change history. So it's true of everywhere. Uh, so we, however, uh, Git has option that uh, if you do some mistake, you can uh, uh, revert, not the revert commit, you can do some uh, uh, hack to push the code forcefully to fix something, changing the history or amending the commit, which is not recommended uh, to get a good, uh, uh, experience with Git. Rather, there are options to uh, uh, reward the actual, to rectify the mistakes and uh, create a new commit, which really a good history of, uh, chain of history you can keep so that you know where something went wrong. And it 
mostly will result uh, conflicts and error messages for your co-contributors of the same program if they're uh, pulling your code and try to merge uh, up to uh, onto their changes. So it's, it's very important, and uh, at, at least from my experience, it was very helpful not to do it at some point. Uh, I was used to doing it, and it caused, caused a lot of problems. And then uh, the next one would be uh, choosing a Git workflow. So uh, a workflow is a, a, a kind of a recipe uh, for consistent and productive uh, use of Git. Uh, there are various uh, types of Git workflows. For example, basic. Basic means uh, you don't have any uh, uh, complex workflow. You just uh, work on master and you push your code and uh, merge it faster. The other would be a bit more uh, organized for a collaborative environment, such as a centralized workflow, feature-based workflow, and there are Git workflow. There are thousands of them. Uh, all you need to do is choose one, the source for your uh, uh, team and the environment, and stick to that. Next uh, important one would be leveraging the Git hooks. These are cool uh, things, actually. They let you enforce standards. So for example, link checks. Uh, if you are writing code in a, in Python, for example, you would be able to apply uh, some code uh, standard checks, static analysis, and all those things. They can be used in the Git hook. So when you push the code, uh, before pushing, it would check if uh, the code has uh, code passed all those checks, and then only it will push. Uh, if not, then it will prevent you to push, and it will let you know what are the problems are and you would be able to fix it. So it saves, really saves time and for others to have wrong or uh, bad commits. Uh, also, you can run test, automate uh, other necessary pre-post actions, and there are much more. So this is one of good things, good thing to uh, uh, look at. The next one would be, do not commit generated or environment config, uh, which means uh, anything you can generate uh, runtime, we should not commit them because uh, they they uh, could be generated and they they are not usually uh, generated as same always. So uh, it is rather uh, let the local environment generate them when they pull the uh, repository. Same goes for environment related config. They are uh, not static. They changes environment to environment. So if uh, such kind of uh, Configuration should not be committed to the uh, repository itself. And also, if we push this generated files and stuff, it can uh, significantly increase the repository size, and eventually it will call, cause uh, Git performance issues. The next one would be, uh, should not commit sensitive information, because uh, exposing the sensitive information can really uh, uh, lead to a bad situation for an individual or even uh, for a company. And uh, sensitive information consists such as uh, access tokens, IP addresses, secrets, or any other form of credentials, even like files from the operating systems, which could have information which can compromise your security. Uh, these lists are not limited to there. Uh, so many other things uh, we should not commit uh, those things in local uh, Git repository. The next, uh, and also we could use Git ignore uh, to uh, exclude those unwanted files being pushed into remote repository. It's really good practice to uh, follow. And the next one is uh, securing Git repository. So uh, we should set appropriate access permissions. All of this should be available via the vendor we are using. It could be GitHub, it could be GitLab, or Bitbucket, any other Git uh, hosting uh, uh, vendors. We should set appropriate access permissions. Even if we implement it by ourselves, the server, it still should have, should follow those things. Always enforce the principle of uh, list privilege. By that, we mean that uh, allow only necessary permissions, even if uh, there is no sp uh, specific reason to do it. Uh, for example, if uh, you start a repository, it should start from private. If there is a, a specific reason to make it public, then only you make it public. 
otherwise keep it uh, private with the appropriate access permission for relevant uh, contributors. And always enable branch protection rules. Branch protection rules means how to merge them to different uh, 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 section. For example, if you are uh, developing a development branch, how they are going to be merged to master, there should be some uh, protected rules. For example, it should pass all the tests, it should pass uh, all the security checks, it should uh, follow certain principles, and then only it will be able to merge to uh, master branch. And always look out for vendor specific security best practices. They always publish them. Uh, for example, GitHub has always uh, recommended their uh, users to follow certain best practices, two factor authentication or some other form of uh, uh, secure authentication practices. So these are a very important uh, aspect of security we should follow for the game. And uh, leverage vendor specific productivity features. These are really uh, nice features to be productive. So code change suggestion in pull request in GitHub. So for example, if you uh, do a code review in GitHub, there are some ways to uh, uh, request a change with a suggestion. You are changing the code in real time using the ID and the uh, uh, author probably uh, will be able to accept it without pushing a new commit from their side or anything. So this really increases the uh, productivity. And there are a bunch of other uh, uh, cool tricks to do, productivity tips provided. I added uh, some link here. Uh, auto link references and URLs. For example, if you are working on an issue, if that issue tracker is somewhere, you can always link them to your uh, pull request. And that's a very good way to uh, link those things so that uh, anyone reviewing the code can go to the um, uh, issue and uh, see what exactly this uh, pull request is solving. And that helps uh, big time and jump to a function when reviewing a code. So uh, it's a very, this is one I found very uh, uh, interesting because uh, often uh, when there is a big pull request, you don't know who is calling for. So uh, a way to jump from function to function is really very helpful. So GitHub has all those uh, features and there are much more. Uh, don't forget to check those out. And the final uh, tip for the kit is uh, do not panic. Uh, that is the lesson I learned. I used to panic when I broke something uh, and, and then I make a, make more mess of it. Uh, over time I realized that there is nothing to panic. It tries its best to uh, uh, keep the history as uh, easy as it's possible to change in future. So change as in like not history change as in you rectify the mistakes by committing another change, but you can easily traverse back and see what went wrong and fix them. So the final lesson here is uh, do not panic. So the conclusion is uh, why we actually can want to adopt to those best practices. So adopting these best practices helps development team to be consistent, productive, and eventually contribute to produce a, a quality, high quality product. And uh, uh, that's what is my takeaway from uh, using Git in a, in a standard way or recommended way. Cool. I think we can take some questions before we uh, go to the next sections, if there is any. Thank you. Thank you, Sham, so much. That was very nicely putting together a comprehensive and very valuable um, do we have any questions about Git or GitHub specifically? I, uh, I have a question, Shams. Thank you so much for this uh, great introduction. So you're, um, it's kind of counterintuitive for me, and, but I really value your opinion on that, that Git is kind of perfect for versioning, but we should not go to versions before. Right, so you're saying uh, we should not change the history, but we should move forward. But sometimes it may exactly be the case that we do want to go back to a previous version because we introduce errors. So 
maybe uh, I'm, I'm not uh, experienced. Uh, I use GitHub, but I'm not an experienced power user. Like, how would you, um, how would you do, implement that if you had a working version and you uh, committed an error? Okay, so uh, it depends on uh, how, how old the data is <clears throat> or the commit is. So for example, if I committed something uh, uh, yesterday and today I'm working on something and I realized that last commit was wrong, I can always revert. There is git revert command. So always you can revert, even you can revert old ones. Uh, old ones might sometimes cause problems, but that's the right way to do. So if you revert that, it just reverts that code. It's a command, git revert and then the commit. So okay. if you revert that, it just mm -hmm. reverts that piece of code, means that it's a new commit, but it's a revert commit. So you keep the, you still are going forward, but you are not changing the history of what happened in the uh, past. Okay, I see. So I thought that reverting would uh, also be a way to change the history. But since reverting is also a next move forward, you uh, wouldn't consider that changing the history. No, it's basically a comment, right? You are saying that I, I see. mistake. So uh, this should be, for example, you missed a uh, uh, apostrophe. You are going to add it in future. Uh, but maybe you will remove it. So you. Are going yeah. there. It's a, a silly example, but to make it clear, you go there and just do that, and then okay, I will do it uh, in different way in the next uh, comment. Okay, we have another less dumb question, I think, uh, from uh, Johannes Achtin. Oh, no, there is no dumb questions. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, uh, and I learned it that way. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so Johannes is asking whether you uh, have any kind of standard or uh, or template for commit messages that you adhere to. Uh, so it uh, in my if I go back quickly here, the first slide. Uh, so this is the basic uh, uh, template I follow, and that that works for me. Uh, most of the cases, well, we add a few inf more information in the body, but that's more, that's not part of the template, that's part of the commit message you were using. So standard way is like type, title, and then optional body if you want. The body is not really important. So for us, we tag the ticket, for example, the issue ticket. So we yeah. don't need to explain what it is. We just tell the uh, title. Yeah, so Jonathan and uh, Johannes, I, I guess from our data analysis perspective, it would definitely make sense to try and uh, have a few types of commits standardized and um, maybe even how to uh, uh, compose the title message of these commits that would probably uh, enhance our way we collaborate on code. It's a great point. Okay, thanks, Shams. Great, I think we can move on. Let's go. Cool. Okay, now the software testing. <clears throat> uh, so uh, before we talk about uh, best practices, I want to highlight at least uh, what it means. So uh, is a process, software testing is a process of evaluating and verifying that a software product or application, what we are working on, does what it's supposed to do, right? Otherwise, there is no point to have a, a software if it cannot do what it's supposed to do. Uh, so uh, why software testing is actually important? Because uh, I had had this question in my early uh, career a lot, like why should we spend time on testing software? And uh, eventually it turned out that, uh, well, from my experience as well as others uh, out there in the community, that it saves money a big time. It saves a lot of time. It produces a quality product. It uh, brings customer satisfaction for sure, because end, in the end, there is a customer of the product we are building always, whether it is a, a e-commerce software or a medical software or a scientific project. In the end, there could be a customer who uses that. If it does not fulfill the customer requirement or need, then there is no point of building that software in the first place. It saves, sometimes it saves reputation and sometimes it saves life. Uh, how we might uh, see in uh, next uh, slides. So among many other uh, incident, uh, major incident caused by lack of good software testing, 
here is the one example we can take a look at. So uh, Therac 25 was a computer controlled radiation therapy machine, which was produced by uh, Atomic Energy of Canada Limited uh, in 1982. It was involved in at least six accidents between six major accidents actually between 1985 and 1987, in which uh, patients were given massive overdoses of radiation. Uh, it killed four and leave, left two uh, others with uh, lifelong injuries because of uh, high uh, overdoses of radiation. But what was the problem? Why why it happened? So uh, after a uh, lot of investigation, uh, they found out that uh, there was two root causes. First was the software controlling the machine contained bugs, which proved to be fatal. And secondly, the design of the machine relied on controlling the computer alone for safety, computer alone. There was no hardware interlocks or any, any supervisory circuit or anything which could ensure if there is a software bug, the, uh, uh, the physical hardware would at least uh, uh, prevent any catastrophic failures. So what these were the root causes and uh, the, the moral of that is the, the company never tested it with the combination of software and the hardware until it was assembled at the hospital. And that was the biggest mistake. They individually probably tested some part of it, but they never tested it as a whole, which, which was one of the uh, main reasons they couldn't identify the problems before it uh, killed few people's, people already. So from this, we, we can see how important it could be for a company to uh, save its reputation. And also there is nothing worse can happen uh, more than killing people with uh, this kind of technologies. So uh, I think that's a good, very good reason to uh, test software and test it better. So let's uh, look at some uh, best practices we can follow to make ensure this uh, incidents never happens or at least reduce to happen. So first one is planning the test. So planning is most important part of a, of a successful and meaningful software testing. This planning uh, could be extensive. This planning could be very uh, generic one, depending on the software project we are working on. Uh, for a big project, this has to be documented. This has to be a separate document than software requirements even. It has to have all the necessary uh, uh, steps very clearly explained. So what should we think about that? We need to think about the scope of testing, which means that what part we should uh, test and how, how they should be tested. For example, from the previous example, uh, it should be tested individually, each unit, and then in the end, it should be, there should be an end-to-end -end test. The complete test, integration test or uh, system test, acceptance test, which makes sure that every component works together very well within a certain uh, context and, uh, and what doesn't work as well. Also, which features to be tested? Which features not to be tested? If not to be tested, and why it should not be tested? And most importantly, industry standards. So industry standards are uh, is for both for product as well as test itself. <clears throat> for product, what we mean is, uh, for example, for a checkout or payment processing software, they must adhere the PCI uh, DSS standard, which means that the payment card industry, uh, they have a data security standard. Each e-commerce company deals with that product and their payment process. They have to follow this if they want to be recognized. And if something bad happened, they will be held accountable by not following those industry standards. And those industry standards should be considered while testing. In medical sector, there is also uh, various standards for various uh, scope. In scientific uh, areas, there are a lot of uh, standards are defined already by the community, uh, uh, which must be followed or adhered uh, when we write test. So this is one of the very important part. And then the test, uh, uh, from the test side, there are also defined standards to follow 
for different type of test. For example, unit test, uh, acceptance test, or many other different type of tests, they have their own industry standards defined by the community uh, working for, on this uh, year after year. And then we have this uh, test matrix and measurements. Uh, we need to monitor all those metrics and measurements. We need to define what would be our acceptable testing uh, 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 coverage. For example, for some cases, 80% test coverage should be fine. And for some cases, probably 100%, less than 100% wouldn't be adequate. For example, where life and death situation, no software should uh, pass without 100% uh, test coverage. So these are very important decisions to make in the beginning of the uh, testing. And then the risk identification. The risk identification is more uh, in both sides also. Uh, what are the risk of testing uh, all those things? Maybe uh, uh, budget-wise, maybe uh, 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 time-wise. So we need to identify those risks in the beginning as well as from the software side. And all these things should maintain a proper check checklist. And there are a lot of, it's a huge topic. Uh, I listed five of them uh, just to be uh, what I found more important uh, and uh, covers the most of it. <clears throat> the next one is automate test process. So we should automate as much as possible. Uh, for example, uh, when we develop, we can use uh, Watcher. Watcher is something which always take a look at your code. And uh, if you do any changes, it instantly run the, uh, uh, run some test or something as you define or as you configure uh, to make sure that you get the feedback faster. You can get what is going uh, wrong rather than waiting the very last moment when you push and then you realize ah, nothing is working or when you share the code and then you realize oh, nothing is working. So automating those is very important and running those in uh, unit test or any other things is very important. The continuous integration is, uh, so it's a very good development practice uh, where we integrate code uh, in a shared repository frequently. Uh, same as the uh, previous section, we said like uh, commit often is the same thing. So when we commit often, we should apply the test also when uh, using the some kind of uh, tooling. For example, in GitHub, there are ways to build the pipelines where you can uh, easily run a test uh, whenever you push something. Only when test is passed, then you can uh, march that to master. So use continuous integration that helps you uh, to automate uh, stuff. Test early and often. This is related to the previous section as well. So uh, test should be continuous. It should not wait until the finishing of the product. Test should be written whenever we start working on something. Uh, each com each section should be uh, tested properly, should be written properly, which helps actually to design a better software because when things are smaller, it's easier to uh, mind map the design of the software. If it's not, uh, if it gets to a bigger stage, it's very hard to. Uh, think about how to fix certain problems and it, it becomes very messy. So it's, better, it's not that we always will be able to do that, but it's better practice to continuously doing, uh, uh, committing in small and testing small. The next is writing quality test. This is very, very, very important. Uh, what I found over the years, we write tests and we uh, write them in a way so that we just cover the uh, basic part of the product and we do it very uh, you know, non-standard way. We did it very non-standard. Eventually we found out that uh, we spend a lot of time to fixing them. Uh, they are breaking all the times and they are giving false positives and uh, a lot of other problems. So we decided to uh, think about how to write those step quality tests. So we aligned with the business goal and then we decided, okay, these are the test cases we should write. And it significantly improved the productivity and also uh, saved a lot of time uh, where we spend uh, uh, to fix them. And then the quality test data. This is very important also. If we test, uh, uh, fit the 
bad data to the test, test might pass, and also at the same time, test might fail with wrong uh, false positive, which is also not good. So choosing the data to test is also a very important uh, aspect. Uh, for example, in a scientific research, the set of data would be huge and every single data point should be accurate and uh, uh, those should be set up as expected and the test cases should reflect those and the code should uh, be able to validate them. And covering the age cases is very important and that's the only easiest way to do it, to write uh, a good test that uh, covers your age cases. So uh, overall, the good software testing is really very, very important we found to deliver a quality product in a, in a reasonable time frame, uh, which really, really brings the customer satisfaction. Uh, so that's, uh, I think, all I have. Uh, if you have uh, questions, I can take. Great. Thank you, thank you so much. I just, I just want to add a, a comment uh, here. Um, uh, we are part. We were trying in this data week to be part of improving open science and making uh, our data available and making our data reusable. Talking about uh, Git and testing, it yes, it's a lot of work. Like building a test for your software might be might be like kind of doubling the work, doubling the time, doubling the effort, it's a lot. But you need to think how much your code is reusable now. When people take your code and your code is covered with tests, once they do something wrong, the test would fail and that will give them better insight what this, your functions and what your code is supposed to do. What uh, your code supposed, how your code is supposed to handle uh, the data. So uh, covering your code with tits, it's a very important thing to make your code reusable because it gives the chance for others to understand what you are exactly doing and how this, your code is uh, meant to handle data. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Shams was a very valuable talk. Do we have any questions? about testing. Sebastian was asking yesterday, do we have him today? Yeah, I think so. But asking about a test-driven development style. What do you think of that, Shams? That's a huge topic. Uh, test-driven development uh, is very useful, uh, I think, especially when uh, there's certain aspect of it. It depends on where you are applying. So. Uh, if, if, for example, if I take a scientific project, I, I think it would be very, very valuable to do a test-driven development because you know uh, what exactly you are going to test, right? Uh, what, you, what, what software you are uh, going to uh, develop, which really helps you to feed the data in the beginning and uh, write the test so it fails. And then uh, when you start writing, developing the code, which satisfies that test and it validates, which I think uh, in certain cases, it really is very helpful. So you think it uh, depends on the project? Yes, I wouldn't recommend it like uh, go to a uh, go to, uh, uh, method uh, for everything because it, it also as a cultural change is not, it, it takes time to adopt that style. And uh, if someone is very, uh, mm, what do you say, like uh, used to, to doing it, I think they could be productive. But in the beginning, you have to make sure that uh, you have that time to be, to spend that, which is, which might not be as productive as you might expect. So it's just a cultural change, to be honest. And from my experience, what I, I found is it takes time to adopt that uh, style, but uh, definitely it helps uh, in, in a certain aspect of software development. Thank you. Um, uh, also, Shams, when, for, from your personal experience, and you've worked in a very huge, big project, and when do you think it's the best stage to start uh, writing your test? It's like in the middle of your coding, or do you think like starting earlier writing your test might help you to think of how you could also should cover the edges of dealing with the uh, 
the back end issue you're dealing with? Good question. So I, in my experience, I think it has to be from the beginning, from the day one. They cannot wait even to day two. What happens with the day two is we never do it in the end. So why, yeah, we say like, okay, we pass day one, we will pass day two as well. So yes, definitely when we think about the test, it helps us to design good code for sure. There is no doubt about it. So the, here comes the TDD, right? The, you write the test first. When you write the test, uh, after that, so you write a fail test. Uh, in TDD, you write a fail test first, and then you start writing the code. Your code satisfies that, and you fix that. And you iterate over and iterate over. So that's, you don't have to follow always like that, but you still can do, well, that's my opinion. Industry might uh, differ on that. You might define a test case, right? You don't have to write the test, but you define a test case and you validate your uh, development code against that set of data. And then when you are satisfied, you write that uh, test after you develop that code. So it's a trade-off, it's, it's the style. I wouldn't, I'm not a big fan of sticking to the rules just for the sake of rules. If it doesn't help you to be productive, it's not really helpful. So I would say like it is, it's a matter of choice. Um, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Also, uh, uh, commenting on this point about conventional trends and conventional habits. Um, yes, um, of course, people for so many things in naming uh, conventional trends and uh, uh, like so many things in, in software development, it's not forced. It's just out there and you're welcome to use it. But what do you think? how important this to make to have a unified style so people could easier understand what you're doing here yeah so uh, it's very important uh, it's very important just we have to make sure what what is best for the team it's not about picking something cool out there it's more about what makes more sense for the team but definitely following a defined standard will always help to be productive and consistent and that's proven. That's proven for sure. Um, Chimon, do you want to speak up or should I read your question? I can also do. Yeah, um, great. Yeah, thanks for the nice talk. So I have a question that is more related to our uh, workflow in the lab a bit. So I think it's a little bit different to research and usually there are like two or three people, um, maybe even maximum, that work on the same project. Do you have any general recommendations regarding the Git workflow in that? Like, do you recommend working with branches or just that everyone commits and then checks out? Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, I might have, but I need a few more information. So uh, in general, so if it's a team of some few people and, uh, you want, do you deploy something, for example, like uh, your code eventually in deployed in a server or in a machine or anywhere, or it just stays there? How do you use that code in the end? It, it should be generally distributed. So it should be used by others and yeah. Okay, so the code is distributed, it's not deployed. So in that sense, I think, <clears throat> I, I would recommend like creating, uh, working on a development branch. So once always, so, it's, a, it's called a sort of Git flow. So you, your master is always the source of truth. Your master is always valid. It has always the valid code. And uh, master or main, nowadays we call it main. Uh, and when someone develops, they develop in a feature branch. And then they push it. And it can be either you can, someone can check that and approve that to be merged to master so that uh, master is always valid. And uh, whenever it happens, it always, checks to master. And other way would be like to uh, have a development branch where everyone merged. And then eventually development branch is merged to master because it is consistent. But it, that flow we do when we deploy code mostly, but if you are code distributing the code, it, has, it, it could be done by a simpler way, as I mentioned in the first uh, uh, suggestion, that push, uh, create a new branch for it, everyone when they work on a feature do the job work and then push it, have a code review uh, set up, 
uh, branch production rules in GitHub where you can apply certain rules and then when all those things passed, you can someone can always march to master. This way you can keep master uh, in a valid state. So don't push in master directly for sure. All right, thank you. Thank you, Shams, for this uh, great talk. Uh, for me, it has been a very uh, eye-opening in terms of uh, the opportunities for standardization and uh, optimization of uh, collaboration in uh, code development. I think what is a little bit special to us is that the code that we are dynamic uh, uh, that we are developing is quite dynamic in the sense that. Um, we don't have a, a product that we want to sell or we want to be finished, but rather there's always an ongoing uh, development. And um, I think we will have to uh, uh, discuss further within our groups and collaborations how we define um, the working master because uh, the way I dealt with code was uh, very uh, amateurish and uh, I simply always uh, pu pu pushed everything that I developed but of course this doesn't add to reproducibility in fact it creates uh, uh, errors and bugs for people who used previous versions of the code and we should definitely move away from that. I think Andy Horn has uh, really uh, created a perfect example of how the development branch in ETBS uh, is always uh, on the cutting edge of uh, the next tools that can be used for the research, but also having uh, this master branch and some other branches even with specific tools. I think uh, at some point we had the uh, uh, BITS standardization branch and things. So I think we can be on one hand more creative in our academic uh, surrounding, look for good examples like ETBS, and then also uh, uh, try to be uh, democratic and uh, uh, try to develop standards and how we want to, for example, push releases and how which features uh, should be pushed to the master branch. And one example would be, for example, we, we, our, our functions can be quite small. It could just be one and more analysis step which would be helpful for many people. So it might be useful to push it directly to the master branch as soon as it works. But then uh, there might be other uh, people working in the development branch on uh, things that do not work yet. So how, how would you deal with these things? So uh, if you have not one final product, but maybe uh, like three different aspects of, uh, of a software tool, and um, some people write a code that should be pushed to the master branch, but others are writing code that should not be pushed. Do you think it makes sense to create a branch for different developers then, or is there a way to do that in Git? Yeah, so that's what I was explaining. Uh, so when, let's say I have a task to do, I uh, should pull the branch, uh, master branch, and then I should create a new branch locally. So, and I should develop uh, my changes there. And then I push that branch. And in Git, you will, that's called pull request. So when you push the, your branch, it will show, GitHub will show you, if you use GitHub, GitHub will show you, okay, you pushed it. Now you can create a pull request, which will be a difference between what you have in master and what you have in your changes. And then, uh, once, so there is an approval process. It is very simple. Like if someone says, okay, uh, in the uh, group, in a collaborator uh, uh, group, someone says, okay, this code looks good. They can, uh, within a matter of button click, you can march that changes to the master. And that will keep you saying uh, at least to check. Even if no one approves, it will allow the developer to see what changes I made uh, to the master before I march these changes. But if you directly push, you don't really know what happened. And uh, that's very dangerous. Yeah. Uh, Shams mentioned two, two beautiful points. The first point is each feature and each little ticket has a different branch. So your project might end up with 200 branches. Don't, it's okay. But that's the best way to document changes and how you a project evolved. A second beautiful practice is reviewing 
that I push my code not to the master, to my branch, and then people or my colleagues show up, look at my code and say, what did you do here? Why did you do this? Why won't you do this? They review my code and upon a little bit of discussion after each update at GitHub, for example, or at your vendor, then we push to the master. These are uh, very two beautiful practices. Thank you, Shams, for mentioning that. Uh, Jonathan, I, th I think he was uh, trying to uh, say something. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this talk. This was really, really great. Uh, actually, I actually have a very basic question. I think a lot of people uh, in this group or in general do have a clinical or biomedical uh, background, but all of a sudden in their project, they are assumed to code, to do some software development and so on. Um, where to get more uh, learning resources, like really entry learning resources for software uh, development and good practice for people with you no know, biological backgrounds. Okay, uh, so uh, YouTube is my uh, like go-to uh, environment. In YouTube, there are a lot of tutorials and all those things. And that's the uh, most common way I follow. And others are like, uh, I use, sometimes I take courses uh, from different places. For example, Udemy or Coursera. If, I, if I'm very new to uh, a technology, which I really don't know the basics or fundamentals, I try to take that course to understand that first. And then I use mostly Google to find out the resources, YouTube or some other places. So that's how I usually uh, go at it. There isn't a single uh, software development um, hub in which you know just the basic standards are like this is what you need to know before you actually enter the field. Yeah, I hear you saying you just need to find on Google some courses or information really more specifically dedicated to the topic you want to learn and not just gaining more abstract skills in software development. Okay, uh, I. Don't, it's a huge uh, area, so there is no a single place where you can get all those things. There are some, uh, 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 what do you say, the community uh, standards in, uh, uh, in the internet you can find it easily. They, they define some standards uh, to follow, but that those also are uh, specific to some community, right? Because there are different concepts and they vary, uh, uh, they differ time to time. And there are Linux Foundation, there are Cloud Native Foundation. They all publish uh, standards, best practices. There is uh, uh, IETF, if I'm not wrong, which is uh, the standard of internet protocols and all those stuff. So there are various uh, uh, places to find those standards. It's specific to each area. And does that answer your question? Okay, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I want to get back to uh, uh, Safa's uh, uh, comment on uh, branch. So branch will, uh, as she mentioned, branch will not be a problem because once you march with master or do something with that, you can set up a discard uh, 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 config that that branch will be gone. So that should not be a problem in long term. Yeah, thank you. Shabash, you want to uh, add something? Um, yeah, thank you a lot for your uh, talk. Um, I have a question uh, regarding mocking because uh, mostly people recommend use mocks in unit tests. Um, but uh, I think if I change something in the, the real function, which I actually mock, then I have always to think to change also or adapt the, also the mock uh, in the test function. Uh, so I prefer actually not to use them. Uh, what do you think about it? So, uh unit test meant to be testing a unit of the code, right? And mock, what we mock is, which is not part of that particular unit. So uh, mock, uh, I think the best way to uh, deal with this situation in unit test, uh, I'm not sure what uh, you meant by when changes happen in the real mock method, then you have to change in the test. Usually that shouldn't be until the interface changes. Interface changes means that mock is basically an interface, right? It just says like, okay, this something like this should be called and uh, this might be uh, resulting. So if that changes, that makes sense uh, for me to reflect in the test also because 
That's a major change, which I'm collaborating with that says that something changed because I'm expecting something from that particular uh, mocked function or mocked uh, class or whatever. So I think in that case, it makes sense. And that's a, a good practice to follow actually. Thanks. And also it depends on the design. Uh, so we often say like when this kind of problem happens, there is a problem with the design. There is a, uh, there is a, a the strong coupling between two components, which causes this kind of issue. So we usually look back to the design that why changing this reflects onto everything. It shouldn't be, at least in the unit test. Yeah, if it is a uh, integration test, probably it would fail because the whole thing's supposed to work together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other questions? I guess my presentation was very short. <laughs> Great. Your presentation was amazing. And um, thank you for the rich discussion. Uh, you've solved uh, a lot of mysteries. We, uh, it was our pleasure to have you. That was a great talk. And for today, we are done with our first part of Data Week. Uh, OK, we have, um, we have a comment from Jonathan. Thank you. I think I gave you a lot of skills in Python and MATLAB and but uh, that does not make one a good software developer. Well, with time, it will. I feel more abstract concepts of how to make sure your code is uh, understandable, transferable, flexible, or reducible, requires more training in the uh, real of software development. I guess that is a general problem uh, for all kinds of scient uh, scientists. Yes, uh, I, I would agree with you. Uh, making your uh, data reusable and uh, uh, understandable is really a lot of work. Right, Shams, from your experience? Uh, definitely, if it, it, it helps to uh, think that way that I, even after that many years, if I still write a code, maybe my uh, colleague would say, oh, this is not right, you have to do it this way. And that's, <laughs> and that's how we learned. Yeah, that's true. It's every of course. single day. Day to day. Yeah. There is no st stopping to learn. You could not, I mean, technology also changes. Today's best practice might not be applicable tomorrow. So uh, we have to uh, adapt to that situation. And yeah, more practice yeah. and that's the only way to uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, part on 